science. We get experimental yes. science. We're curious, non judgmental. Talking about parasites tonight. Scary parasites that cause changes in behavior of many different kinds and cause it to form ectopic limbs. So additional legs on the body of the frog will just start forming left, right, and center. Scary, yes. Fascinating, I think so. Uh, the parasite uh, first infects snails. From snails, it goes out and bores into a developing tadpole. After it does something to the developing tadpole, it actually grows an additional series of legs that then make it easier to be caught by a bird, which then completes the life cycle of the parasite. Um, it's a phenomena called ectopic legs. Ectopic limbs and whatnot are not a one-off kind of deal. They are just growth of tissues where they don't belong originally. So again, you'd imagine these legs are only supposed to be on all the two sides of the back legs. Uh, so they're non-functional, but they're starting to grow in the tissue. Called Ribiuria on the tray. And let's see what these frogs actually look like. So, what this parasite is doing, there's not enough known about how this actually works because what you'd have to take into account is that these parasites are in changing developmental genes or the regulation of certain genes during development to induce the growth of tissue where there shouldn't be tissue. Right, that is absolutely wild that such a thing like that can happen. How it's known where to localize, so where this extra tissue should grow, and how it should grow is what's currently unknown, but it'd be really neat to figure that out because you get a lot of developmental biology questions answered. Peter, as you can see, this frog, there's its primary leg, and this is a mirror image of the other side. There's two extra legs that have grown out. They're non-functional. So it can't jump around with these extra legs, but it, they are in fact there. So it, this isn't the only time that something like this has been observed in nature. We've done this with fruit flies. So you can change expression of certain fruit fly genes and get what are called ectopic legs. Same as you see here, ectopic legs means that it's gonna be growing on the outside of the organism in random places, but they're non-functional. So Sparky, those are non-functional legs. What they do is they slow down the animal to the point where they're not gonna be able to escape predators. With the fruit flies that we've done this to, actually, let me show you an image to really, a lot of this developmental biology here. Henna should be, there are legs. So right here, instead of antennae, you have the legs of the fly that it's it's happening there. And uh, here's another like a hand-drawn diagram of that as well. So instead of having regular antennal tissue, you have their legs growing out where the antennae are. This isn't just limited to antennal tissue this could be any kind of tissue during development here for example are what are called ectopic eyes so there is eye tissue growing all over this animal and instead of having its normal legs and wings you see these red masses of tissue those are eye cells they are non-functional right they're not going to be doing really anything there's no there's they can't see on all parts of their body it is but a developmental and genetic quirk that created this kind of effect and so that's what you're seeing here are these ectopic eyes being expressed and that's again similar to our little frog here it's not quite clear to me based on the reading that i was doing whether or not they would they target in the same place each time and that's what causes the hind limbs to form extra or if you were to insert them into different parts of the tadpole you can trigger it elsewhere i think more data needs to be acquired on that front to see exactly what the mechanism at play is no no it doesn't affect humans coolly so these go through snails to tadpoles to adult frogs to birds and then the cycle starts again so as of right now these do not affect us no if you eat these parasites on accident nothing should end up happening to you if we look at an infected tadpole can we see the cyst on them that is a great question sparky so essentially spark like, these little like flashes of light are what we're looking for those are the parasites my understanding is that while they do burrow into the developing tadpole the immune system acts fast enough where it actually will heal up the wound and then you can't really tell if that's originally like a cyst side or what, what exactly it might be happening there. It's just something that we just need to keep an eye on multiple times to figure out what exactly is going on underneath in the developing tadpole. It might be one of those two spark you see it when it's too late. Like that we can't, we don't see it like early enough to be able to remove it from them.
these statements of the ease by which the prey are captured tend to be really, really difficult because it's so hard to actually prove. They're you the way that scientists usually have I've seen in papers are like ecology papers where they'll make a model and see if that model makes it easier or harder to be caught. It's kind of contrived and difficult to really prove if that's the case. Is there a possibility that these frogs could eventually evolve to be able to use the extra legs? So glued, most likely it's your second one. So I don't know if you were here earlier, but we were talking about this phenomenon called the Red Queen Hypothesis, where the parasite and a host are in a constant arms race. One's always trying to beat the other one in order to for survival. And so that's most likely what's happening here is that this is probably not 100% of an infection rate. Like not every frog that gets it will end up having extra limbs. And so most likely those are the frogs frogs that have a more potent immune response against this parasite versus the ones that grow all these limbs and then they get eaten so their their bloodline right their genetics end with them being eaten so you can imagine a situation where the ones that have fewer limbs extra limbs are able to better survive and so those are the genes that are get passed on those can maybe survive better from the parasite and then the parasite needs to evolve further to be to successfully infect those ones that are now better at surviving and so it's this constant arm race and yes yeah, as uh, artology's question was what's the purpose as glued just said it's kind of like a population control so that's talked a little bit about cordyceps fungus earlier tonight those the hypothesis of why that fungus exists as a meat way of brain control to kill off populations the hypothesis is is to keep populations in check whether or not that is its true purpose it's very difficult to really prove without a shadow of a doubt but that is what is suspected for them to exist as yeah and then that's why we have these kinds of parasites we will probably will never be able to prove that really but those are the given hypotheses not this one sparky there are other fungi that are killing frog species so there's that actually infects frogs and it almost has a near 100 percent for mortality rate and the only way to get that from the fungus like not killing the frogs if they're brought into the lab and cured uh, like given antifungals and released back into the wild however if they get reinfected it's the same thing again and again it's this invasive species of fungus that's spreading across and now a southwest united states that one the, where the frogs are suffering it's not a parasite per se just it's a fungus that just kills the frogs so that's one one, like that's not a check and balance that's just like an invasive widespread species right now it says uh, artology was saying it's more of a check and a balance to keep populations in control at least for this particular parasite because again it's not 100 percent effective it's effective enough to lower the population but there are other ones that can also go and uh, survive better can be found this used for humans to maybe go grow extra limbs that somebody may lost uh so tactile probably not only because this is early in development so it is not causing limb growth in existing adults which is what you would need to be able to utilize for that kind of hypothesis but rather because it's growing in developing embryos it's just turning on gene expression for limb development in places where it shouldn't be on and it has the cell types in the developing tadpole to be able to do that in the adult you no longer have those cell types and so even if you start turning on those genes because you don't have the right cell types you probably won't get anything to happen a much better one tactile right now that folks are studying for limb regeneration are salamanders because then uh, the adult you can chop off the limb of a salamander and it'll grow back its arm with the skeletal system and nervous system and musculature intact and that would probably be the best way to regrow limb for limb regeneration studies at least that's the current hope for that if this frog bred and it had would affect the next generation of frogs uh, the tail no the limbs the arms um i'm not sure sparky I don't remember seeing any studies that looked at transgenerational effects, so across generational effects of being infected by this and having the extra limbs. My bet, Sparky, if I had to guess, nothing would happen to the next generation because these parasites aren't affecting the reproductive organs. All they're doing is when that cyst forms, those cells and that parasite is contained in that cyst, and that's where they're triggering growth of those extra limbs. And so as long as it's not hitting the reproductive organs, which it doesn't seem like it is the next generation should not be affected 
but again that's that's something that does need to be tested out because you never know if there's something that crosses like a blood brain barrier or any kind of tissue barrier right and could ne negatively impact these animals post development it shouldn't be glued it all it should be doing is these this parasite is turning on genes developmental genes in an area where it should not be turned on so in theory if you sequence the dna of the frog before and after infection it should be identical it's just using that genome to express genes in a different way where they should not be expressed and that's pretty metal in my mind